Shabbat Shalom. Of course, we know that Hanukkah is a minor holiday. It's not even in the Bible. It is a post-biblical Talmudic rabbinic holiday that we see just really a small paragraph or so in the Talmud. So we know by and large Hanukkah is a small minor holiday. But here in America, given its proximity to something else that appears in December, I've heard, Hanukkah has taken on a life of its own and has become much bigger in the last century or so as part of the American existence. So here's my question to you. How many of you celebrate Hanukkah as a minor holiday? And how many of you celebrate it as one of the major holidays of the year? So by a show of hands, how many for whom is Hanukkah a minor, small holiday? All right. For how many is Hanukkah a major, big deal? Interesting. Somehow all the kids' hands are up. Go figure. I grew up in Troy. In my high school, Troy Athens High School, of 1,600 students, I could count on one hand the number of Jews. So my parents made a choice that growing up in the latter part of the 20th century, Hanukkah was very big. Now remember the context. Every year without fail, I would color a picture of Santa Claus. When you went into a classroom, and it didn't matter what grade, when you went into a classroom, there was a Christmas tree, and hanging on the Christmas tree was all the pictures that the kids had drawn as ornaments, and the one Jewish star that that Aaron kid did. So every year I remember, my mother would come in, she would teach about Hanukkah, jelly donuts, dreidels. What's interesting is that my classmates in the Troy School District were actually more excited about Hanukkah than even I was because they knew about all the treats that Mrs. Starr was going to bring in any given year of Hanukkah. We got gifts galore. Because really, and I don't want to speak for them, they're here, you can ask them at, at lunch. Put you on the spot. But it was almost do or die. Because here, Hanukkah was juxtaposed to that other December holiday. And for those of us who grew up in Troy, or if you know anyone who grew up in the Upper Peninsula, it's probably a similar situation. It would have been real easy to assimilate out. It would have been real easy to not even acknowledge our Judaism. It would have been real easy to say, wow, that Christmas holiday seems a lot better. Look at all the gifts that you get. And so my parents decided to go big or go home and made Hanukkah this massive celebration. And I will tell you to this day, Hanukkah remains one of my favorite holidays. And here's a real surprise. For some reason, it's one of my children's favorite holidays as well. They give thanks every year for Saba and Safta in their life. So we come now to this Shabbat of Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is an interesting holiday because if you look at it just from a snapshot, what is it? It's the story of the Maccabees. Now really the family was named in Hebrew the Chashmonaim, right? Often translated as Hesmonian. But we nicknamed them the Maccabees. And no one is entirely sure why we call them the Maccabees. Some say it was an ancient word for hammer. And perhaps the lead Maccabees' heads were shaped like hammers. I didn't make up the explanation, I'm just giving it to you. There's other people who say that no, the word Maccabee is actually a, an acronym for the rallying cry of the Hasmonean family, which was Mika Mocha Ba'ilim Adonai, right? Who is like you, God? And if you look at the first of each of those letters, it spells the word Maccabee. So here we celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah and the Maccabees. And we look at this narrow snapshot, and it's this amazing holiday of our ancestors battling against assimilation, right? We know that the Greek Syrians who were in charge of the land after Alexander the Great had come through and conquered and Alexander himself died and the kingdom divided and the Greek Syrians were in control of the land and ultimately they sought to further Hellenize the country. And not only did they seek to further Hellenize the country and assimilate the Jews into this Hellenistic culture, but they trafed up the Beit HaMikdash 
right? They brought in idols. They brought in non-kosher animals into the holy temple. They forbid circumcision. They forbid celebration of Shabbat. And so we look at Hanukkah as a snapshot and what our rabbis tell us in the Talmud where really this holiday of Hanukkah comes from. It, Hanukkah symbolizes our constant need each and every year to battle against assimilation, to keep the Jewish people strong. And that's what Hanukkah is, right? We put our Hanukkiot in the window to celebrate the miracle, presume Nisa and Aramaic, to celebrate the miracle of God responding to us standing up for the Jewish people. And in fact, our, our ancestors were so afraid of this idea that they began to transform the holiday of Hanukkah from a celebration of a military victory into a minor religious holiday because they knew what it meant to live in a non-Jewish land and to celebrate a military victory against your non-Jewish enemy. So the holiday began to change and it became this minor holiday. Yes, we put it in the window, but you only have to do a little bit in the window and safety comes first. But nevertheless, this holiday of Hanukkah comes to remind us about our constant need to battle assimilation. It's a theme we've heard over and over again, certainly even in recent weeks, as I've come back and spoken to you about the USCJ biennial, the conservative movement and liberal Judaism's battle against assimilation. And if we look at the snapshot, Hanukkah is the example par excellence of that battle against assimilation. But if you zoom out a little bit, if you look at the Hasmonean family, not just in the midst of Hanukkah, but in the midst of history, and I know because, look, I'm a 21st century Jew, when I talk about zooming out on anything, I have to do this with my fingers. Why? Because that's what you do on your iPhone or your iPad, right? So if we zoom out a little bit, and we look at the history of the Hasmoneans, what we see immediately following the Hanukkah holiday is the continuing decline of the Jewish people. Because it did not take long for the Hasmonean family to become corrupt. And through the corruption of their leadership, the leadership of the Jewish people actually became even more Hellenized. And it allowed the Romans to come in and take over. And ultimately because of the corruption, uh, both the spiritual and the, the governmental corruption of the Hasmonean family, the Romans came in, Herod became king. Ultimately, the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, was destroyed, and the Jews were expelled from the land of Israel. And yes, we can place a lot of that blame on the Hasmonean family and their descendants. So if we look at the snapshot of Hanukkah, it's this amazing holiday against assimilation, standing up for keeping the Jews insular and strong and small together as one people, totally shutting out the outside world. And that's something worthy of celebration. Hanukkah is worthy of celebration. But if we zoom out and we look at the history of the Hasmonean family, if we look at the Maccabees generation after generation, they actually led to the destruction of the Jewish people. It brings us now to our Torah portion this week, Parashat Miketz. And you're welcome to turn with me if you like in your Eitz Chaim Chumashim. I'm on page 253. And here we are in the midst of the Joseph story. You know it well because the Torah bases itself upon that wonderful play starring Donny Osmond. And so we hear, we are going through the Joseph story, and I'm in Genesis chapter 41, once again, page 253. Joseph has been brought out of prison because of his incredible ability to interpret dreams. And we know of Pharaoh's dreams the seven cows healthy, the seven cows dying. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven healthy cows are seven years, and the seven uh, healthy ears are seven years. It is the same dream. The seven lean and ugly cows that followed are seven years, as are also the seven empty ears scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I have told Pharaoh, Joseph said, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Immediately ahead are seven years of great abundance in all the land of Egypt. After them will come seven years of famine and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. As the land is ravaged by famine, no trace of the abundance will be left in the land because of the famine thereafter, for it will be very severe. 
as for Pharaoh having the same dream twice. It means that the matter has been determined by God and that God will soon carry it out. So what, of course, do we know? We know that Pharaoh had this dream that there would be seven years of plenty, especially in the land of Egypt, and that there would be seven years thereafter of famine, not just in the land of Egypt, but throughout the entire Middle East. Why does that matter? Because we know Jacob and the rest of Jacob's children are still in the land of Israel. And they're going to suffer from an incredible famine that will actually drive them out of their land in search of food. We continue. Accordingly, let Pharaoh find a man of discernment and wisdom and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh take steps to appoint overseers over the land and organize the land of Egypt in the seven years of plenty. Pharaoh is so excited about this plan. He's so excited about God playing a role in the life of Pharaoh and in the life of Egypt that he gets a great idea. He's going to put this Joseph, who was a couple days before in prison for sexual harassment. I can't make this stuff up. He brings him out and he elevates him to the second highest position in all the land. And so, of course, we know Pharaoh says to Joseph, I'm on verse 41, See, I put you in charge of all the land of Egypt. And removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. And he had Joseph dressed in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Pharaoh had Joseph ride in the chariot of his second in command. And they cried before him, Avrech. Thus he placed them over all the land of Egypt. Now we could actually do a whole thing on what does this word avrech mean. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. It sounds like the word bracha and may be connected to that. It may be a Hebraicized version of whatever the Egyptian word that they actually called out to Joseph was. Or if you look down at the bottom of the page uh, in their explanation of avrach, it says perhaps it comes from the Akkadian. And I know you're very fluent in Akkadian, but if you're not, if you forgot your Akkadian from school, here's a little note about it. Pharaoh then says to Yosef, I am Pharaoh. Yet without you, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. As Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs says, Pharaoh just made Joseph the first Jewish economist. And so then Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Sofnat Paneach, and he gave him a, a, for a wife, Osnat, daughter of Potiphara, priest of On. Thus Joseph emerged in charge of the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. If we look at the snapshot of just our Torah portion this week, we see a pretty amazing story. Here Joseph, our little Joseph, Yosela, who had just gone through all these years of suffering. He interpreted the dreams of his brothers and was thrown into a pit. Then from that pit, he was smuggled into Egypt, where ultimately he was accused of sexual harassment and he went even lower into jail. And here he's brought out to the great heights, second in command over all of Egypt. In fact, in so many ways, this is the diaspora dream. Right? The Jewish people suffering upon suffering who are brought up out of their suffering and made, if you'll pardon the expression, the court Jew, participant in the government of this foreign land. If we look at this snapshot, it's very interesting. It seems almost celebratory as well. But we know how the story ends. We know that because of the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine, we know because Joseph was second in command over all of Egypt that Jacob and Joseph's brothers made their way into the land of Egypt. And what happens there in Egypt? There arose a Pharaoh who knew not Yosef. And they were enslaved for 400 years. If we look at the snapshot, it seems what happened to Joseph, worthy of celebration, worthy of joy. But if we zoom out a little bit, we see 400 years of slavery and oppression. Of course, if we zoom out just a little bit farther, we then see the gift of Torah and the redemption of the Jewish people that is at the heart of the story of what it means to be a Jew. 
So how do we then see this story of Yosef? Is it one of celebration? Or is it one of fear because we know what's going to happen next? As we look at the story of Hanukkah, is it one of celebration because we know what happened during those eight days of miracle? Or ought it be one of sadness because we know what happens generations later in the Hasmonean family? And I was thinking about all of this as I am, like the rest of you, part of this American culture that we're in. If you look at the national debate, and pick whatever the debate happens to be, but if you look at the national debate, one side says, aha, if you follow me, I know the right way, and everything will be well with the world. And the other side says, no, 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 if we follow you, all will be wrong with the world. Follow us, and all will be right with the world. And if you look at synagogue conversation, if you look at family dynamics, and at Hanukkah, there are a few family dynamics that play out. If you look at just how we encounter each other on a day-to-day -day level, in the street, in the store, at work, we speak to each other as if we know the answer. If everyone would just listen to us, I know the right way. But do we? Do any of us really know the right way? The Maccabees thought everything that they were doing was great for the Jewish people. And indeed, for that week, it was. But we know what happens next. If you look at Joseph, he seemed like everything that he was doing was right for him, was right for Joseph, and was even right for his brothers and his father that he were able to give them food in the land of Egypt. But if we zoom out, we know that it led to four centuries of slavery and oppression. Do any of us really know the right answer to anything? This Shabbat of Parashat Miketz. By the way, the word Miketz means at the end. Let us remember that we really don't know how the whole story is going to play out. Only God knows. And so perhaps in how we address each other, perhaps in how we view synagogue life, perhaps in how we exchange with each other on the street or in the store or in our offices, and perhaps in how we speak about national affairs and international affairs. Perhaps we will back down a little bit from our own chutzpah to speak with a greater sense of humility, a greater sense of awareness that only God knows the future. And we, we're just humans trying to do our best. Because after all, in the moment we have to make a decision but we're not always blessed with the gift of prophecy to be able to zoom out, zoom out and see what happens further down the road. This Shabbat of Parashat Miketz, may God bless each one of us with wisdom and discernment like Yosef, for sure, but also with an increased sense of humility that all we can do is our very best and know that the rest is in God's hands. Kenyi Ratzon, may this be God's will. And let us say together.